Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, as we continue our series through the book, if you remember it's reported, there's contentions, there's divisions, there's problems, there's fighting, there's open fornication in the church, and the church had issues with judgment. And so that's what he continues. In chapter 5, we see that he was specifically dealing with church correction, kicking somebody out of the church. He gives us a list of four things, then he turns those four into six. He expounds on that list in this chapter as he reminds us where we've come from and what we should stay away from. So as we start in chapter 6, the very first word is dare. This is a strong word. Look what it says, dare any of you. I mean, now, how dare you or don't you dare? Think of how strong of a word this is to start out as he's coming from these thoughts and building up and trying to set things in order. So he says, dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? So straight away, he's giving us this point that we as Christians should not be going to the world for small matters. We should not be going to law with each other or against each other over small matters because the world is unjust in their judgment. So he continues in verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more? The things that pertain to this life. If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. Now, when he says judge small matters, I've used the example as we've talked about this in the past as like uh, you're backing out of the parking lot, you hit somebody's bumper. We could probably solve that a lot cheaper and quicker than calling an insurance company. Now, it's your choice. If you say, hey, you know what? It's my fault. Call my insurance company. That's what I pay them for. They'll take care of it. I'll tell them it's my fault. You know, whatever it is should be worked out rather than, hey, it wasn't my fault. You call the cops. You prove it. You know, instead of having an attitude with brothers and sisters in Christ, we should be reasonably able to work out these small matters. Now, he is dealing with small matters here, and it is important to note when there are sins or crimes what the Old Testament would have said, you're worthy of death, you better call the law. I don't believe it's the church's right to cover up a sin and use this verse to justify it. And I've seen churches do it, and it's not right. Okay, It's very important. There are sins and laws broken that when that happens, yes, you should, you should call the cops, absolutely. However, most simple things... You should, you should not call the law. It's kind of like, in, you know, I was talking with somebody recently about how the state of Florida has, I, I forget the, there's a phrase he used about how the cops in the state is. It's kind of like the man's at fault. There was a, a certain phrase that he used for that, and I forget what it is, but um, it's common knowledge that if you call the sheriff's office over a domestic dispute, somebody's going to jail. Yeah. Well, what happened? Well, we were just arguing. Did you touch her? I didn't touch her. And I know somebody this happened to. She tried to hit me, and I put up my hand to block her. Sir, put your hands behind your back. What? No, she was attacking me, and I, sir, put your hands behind your back. You're going to jail. Absurd. Now, the law is unjust. This is what he's trying to say. The law is unrighteous and unjust. Unfortunately, our justice system is not what it ought to be. We do not live in a theocracy. We do not honor God's law and esteem it as we ought to. We're not following the laws that matter, and we're making big laws out of little things that should not be a law. Uh, I don't know what the number was this year, but I know last year, as we went into January, they said 40,000 new laws are going on the books this year in January. What? Do we really need to build this kind of bureaucratic uh, just waste of space and time and fines and fees? And It's just ridiculous. This is not the purpose of government. It's to protect the innocent. That was the, pur the, the purpose there. And so uh, just understand that, okay? This is not saying cover everything up and keep it inside the church. No, sir. But there are a lot of things that should be dealt internally with the church. Or if even something happened between two brothers outside of the church and you needed somebody to judge in this situation, if you notice in verse 3 at the end there, he says to set them to judge, which are the least esteemed in the church. 
some things don't always have to happen from the top down. Some things can happen from anybody that has the Holy Spirit inside of them. And it's important to recognize that, that because uh, sometimes in larger situations you have, well, well, there's the pastor and his deacons, and he's got his men and his crew, and he's got all that, and they're the ones that make all the decisions. And uh, there needs to be leadership direction for the church, obviously, but when there's contention between two brothers and sisters, you know, any Christian with the Holy Spirit that's walking in the Spirit should be able to discern and righteously judge for their brother and sister and keep something out of court if it's possible, if it doesn't need to go to court. I heard one person say, if you have a problem that money can fix, then you don't have a problem. <laughs> in all reality, if you have a problem that money can fix, you don't have a problem. Right? Continuing after verse 3, let's look at verse 4. He says, if then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. I speak this to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you no, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. Again, we should be able to work these things out. A church that doesn't have people that are able to discern and judge, that's shameful. If everybody just says, well, I don't know, you're not my problem, or I don't care, I showed up for an hour and I left, that's not really the uh, church uh, mentality we should have. We should be able to righteously judge, and he compares that to a wise man that is able to judge between the brethren. Notice it doesn't say be judgmental against your brother. It says when two brothers are having a problem, a wise man filled with the Holy Spirit should be able to step in and help solve that problem and retain the friendship and, re and mend relationships and fix the problems. Continuing in verse 6. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another, why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. He's trying to tell us here that, that when the judgment is off, it's wrong in the church, and it's shameful inside of the church, especially when these things are brought before the unsaved world. And this is important because we live in a digital age. And we've all eyewitnessed experiences where Somebody said something or did something or we've decided we don't like this guy and we're taking it to Facebook first. We're taking it to YouTube. For the unrighteous world, the unbelievers, to make a spectacle of Christianity, look how they are. They want us to be like them and look how they are to each other. Are you kidding me? They're a bunch of hypocrites. Now, Jesus didn't want us to be known as hypocrites like the Pharisees. He wanted us to be known for our love. But obviously, we're not uh, just so loving as they thought they were in chapter 5 that they were puffed up. Now, charity is not puffed up. So we're not just, oh, we love everybody, we don't judge. No, we do judge, and we judge inside the church, and we love a brother enough that we don't have to burn down the whole house so there's no coming back. We burn the whole bridge so there's never an opportunity to restore a friendship. No, in fact, the purpose of chapter 5, when he kicked the guy out, delivered such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, he's saying, okay, let him go. It'll be a sin unto death if he doesn't get it right. Well, guess what? He did. And we'll see in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 that he's saying, hey, he's up on the guy. You don't want him over much sorrow. You should restore such an one and let him back into the church. He fixed the problem. He stopped the fornication. He's living right. Now getting back into church and building back up. Help him to grow as a Christian. He's not done as a Christian. We don't just bury him because he made one mistake in the past. So it's important. And notice how he says that uh, it's better to, how did he say it? He said it, he said uh, in verse 7, Why do you not rather take wrong? What you're doing is wrong. I'm going to the cops. It's not that bad. What you're doing is wrong. I'm going to tell everybody on Facebook. Maybe I'm better off just taking the wrong and telling it to Jesus. Why do you not take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Suffer yourselves to be defrauded. That's a hard one to swallow. Sometimes we want justice. We want revenge. We want payback. What they're doing is wrong to me, and I'm mad about it, and I want everybody to know, and I want to solve it my way. I'm going to get online. I'm going to tell everybody, and why don't you just suffer yourself to be defrauded and trust the Lord to see your heart and their heart and let Him judge between the two of y'all, knowing that the Lord always judges righteously. 
And the biggest point, you let them cheat you if you have to, but the biggest point is that Christians should not be airing their dirty laundry to the lost world. Christians should not be taking every little matter and taking it outside to this lost world, a court system that's fraudulent, costs more money to go there than what you might get back out of the situation. And he's trying to warn us, look, they're unjust, they're ungodly, they're unbelievers, and you want to take a matter of judgment and justice to them when you have the Holy Spirit and there's people in the church that love both of you that could help you resolve this issue. I want to take a step back in these verses we just hit, and I want to define a few terms. Number one, verse number one, the last word in the verse is saints. Look what he says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Now the word saints is defined in context in verse number four, the last word is the church. The last word in verse number five is the brethren. Verse number six, the last word is the unbelievers. So what is a saint? Well, those are the people inside of the church. They are the believers. They are the brethren. And this is important because we live in a day and age where every term in the Bible is under attack by the devil. The Catholics say a saint is somebody that worked for the Pope, that they has now passed, and now they've decided that they've sainthooded them and prayed them into heaven, or they've given them some title now that they're gone of saint. And it's no wonder the world doesn't know. They'll use that phrase, oh, you think you're a saint? I don't think I am. I know I am. But now i got to live up to that title, right? Now i got to work real hard to please the Lord in that title, right? But saint is defined here as church believers, which is important because then you have the Calvinist. The Calvinist would say that God's elect or the saints or those that God divinely picked. They had no say or it wasn't their faith that got them saved. God's a, he's a respecter of persons and he picks individuals he likes to become elect and everybody else is a reprobate. So that's bad doctrine. The dispensationalists will also mislabel this. And of course they will say, well, the elect and the saints, that's just Old Testament Israel that one day may be restored. All three camps are wrong in their version. And of course, even the world is wrong in their understanding. There are many Christians, laymen, that don't have a problem understanding saints means the saved. And that's what is clearly being taught in verse number one. The saints, the church, the brethren, the unbelievers. We have all of that in context because the Bible is a dictionary. Uh, look at verse number two and three. He tells us some important doctrine about our future. Verse two, he says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world. Look at verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels. This is future tense in both regards. There are angels in heaven that are fallen, and they will be below us in the resurrection. Hebrews tells us so. And so we know that we will be kings and priests unto God and His Father. We will serve Him in the millennium and in eternity in a special way. And so one day we will judge the world. One day we will judge, yea, even the angels. And so that's important to remember that judgment is a personal responsibility of Christians. We should not just, well, I don't want to hurt anybody and make a judgment call. Well, you should make a judgment call. You have the Holy Spirit in you. If you have the Word of God in your heart and your mind, you're able to discern very clearly what is right and wrong, and yea, uh, with the power of prayer, you have the ability in an instant to ask for help to make a decision, to make a good judgment call. And God would that we should judge. In fact, again, look at verse 3. Know you not that we shall judge angels, how much more the things that pertain to this life. You're going to judge the next world, so judge in this world as well. Verse 4. If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who the least esteemed in the church. He's saying, you should judge. Don't do it unrighteously. Don't do it by appearance. Don't do it out of balance. Don't be a respecter of persons. Obviously, obviously, there's parameters for how to judge the right way, and we're not going to get too deep into that. But we should judge, and we do it by the Word of God. Look at verse 5. I speak this to your shame. Now listen, it's a shame when a Christian won't judge what's right or wrong. When a Christian won't say, well, that girl's dressed like a boy, that's wrong. That's shameful when a Christian won't say that's wrong. It's shameful when they won't say what the world is doing is wrong and sinful. When they won't call sin, sin, and evil, evil, and they say, well, we'll just blur the lines and everything's gray, and I don't know, God will judge one day. Listen, He already has. 
He's given us a standard to judge by, and we should do it righteously, not with the goal to offend. God's word will offend on its own, but with the goal of, of standing up and proclaiming the truth, and for the sake of the hearers, somebody else might hear it and say, yeah, you know, that's true, that's bold. I had an opportunity like that years ago. I didn't know it at the time, but the situation was it was a man and a woman that were uh, married in their own little way, and she was a sodomite or a Gamorian or whatever you call that, right? And she, I didn't know that. And he was asking the question, what does the Bible say about such animals, you know? And I just told him what the Bible says. And, and I, hey, I'm, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. And I know you have friends that might be a little weird, so we're probably talking about them. But I'm just going to tell you what God said. It's not right. It's not natural. It's a seared conscience they've been given over. Uh, this is strange flesh. They're abusing themselves. They're destroying themselves. They're defiling their body. It's nothing good. It's spiritual possession. I'm, I'm just laying all this out. And he's just like, thank you for telling me the truth. Two years later, and I found out what the truth really was about his situation, all the more, he was very thankful for just, just saying it the way it is. But they didn't have a goal of, you know, destroying, the, burning down the house, so to speak. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wreck your world with this truth. No, I just kind of, hey, I love him, and he, he's asking the truth, and it's a hard question. I, out, of, out of my heart, I'm going to tell him the truth and hope that he understands it and receives it and sees that it's not me being judgmental, but it's that God has already judged. And in his heart, he already knew that was the answer, and yet she wanted something else to be the answer. And so the truth won, as it always does. And it's a shame, as he says in verse 5, when we don't judge. Verse 6, but brother goeth the law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. It's our fault. He says, uh, verse 7 rather, there is, there, now there is utterly a fault among you. It's shameful and it's a fault when we won't judge correctly. So again, remembering that, in fact, go back to verse five, chapter 5 real quick. Remembering that chapter 5 was about misjudgment in the church. Look at verse number 9. I wrote unto you an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of the world, or with the covetous, or the extortioners, or the idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world. You're going to interact with these people, but you shouldn't be known as lumped in with them. Verse 11, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. And here's the big deal. If you're a Christian, if you're called a Christian, you should live like a Christian. And if not, if you're bringing shame to the name of God, don't bring it to the house of God. Listen, I know we're all sinners. And I know we're all, uh, Lord willing, striving to get better. And we're all trying to cast off that old man and put on the new man. I get that. And that's why we come here, to strengthen our spiritual man. That's the goal. That's the plan. And when other people come in that are not as spiritually strong as you, you know, let's not throw them out. But let's not turn a blind eye to sin and wickedness in the congregation either. There has to be this perfect balance. We shouldn't be known as a church that allows sin openly and we turn a blind eye because we just love everybody. He says, 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if a man that is called a brother be a fornicator, covetous, or an idolater, a railer, a drunkard, or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without. Do not ye judge them that are within. He's saying, don't you judge inside the church. Let God judge them that are outside of the church. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So go back to chapter 6. So as he gave all that information about how we should judge in the church, we should judge when it's major sin, but we should also judge in the smallest matters. And when there are small matters that we can handle amongst ourselves rather than take it to the court system, we should absolutely do that so we don't have a reputation of we're going to the law again, we're going to the world again, we're going to the court, we're going to the government. God's greater than all those things. And we have God in us through the power of the Holy Spirit, and we should exercise that and please Him by laying down our life. And sometimes that means we're, we're suffering, we're defrauded, and that's okay. I'll just move on. The Lord will replace. The Lord will provide. So keeping that in mind as we continue in verse number 9. And, and now in verse number 9, as he picks up the chapter, he kind of shifts gears as he gives us a list of some of these secular or sensual sins that are dealt with in the church. This list is very similar to what we just saw in chapter 5, but this is what we expect of the world, but not of the saints, not of the Christians. So look at verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? 
be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But then he continues, he says, and such were some of you. And he tries to, hey, look, there's a whole list of sins that I don't want you to associate with, and you used to be guilty of some of these. And this is important because thank God that Jesus died for all sins. Amen? Amen. Without his forgiveness, none of us would be in the church. None of us would be saints. None of us would be sanctified, set apart. None of us would be washed. None of us would be justified. And so when he gives this list of sins here, like I said, this is identical to the list we saw in the previous chapter, reasons to kick somebody out. He does add a few details. Instead of railers, here he says revilers. Similar but different, but almost the same concept, right? Uh, he still has the extortioners and idolaters, and uh, he adds thieves, I think it is, uh, effeminate and abusers. And we'll deal with those in just a minute, but I do want you to understand the essence of the context before we dig into any definitions. What is he saying in verses 9 through 11 when he says that uh, in verse 9, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? That phrase summarizes all of 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Number one, the lost world Guess what? They don't get to go to heaven. Number two, your sinful flesh, it also does not get to go to heaven. We are made a new man. Our soul is sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise. It's sealed until the day of redemption. We have something to look forward to. That Holy Spirit is, looking, is working inside of us, and we're trying to work out our salvation while we're in this old rotten flesh. And our flesh is filthy rags, and our flesh will not go to heaven. In the resurrection, uh, this flesh will stay behind and we will get a new body. So this body will pass away. So there's two aspects to what he's saying here. The world lives by this list of sins, and they're not going to heaven. And because you're a Christian, you should not be known by this list of sins. Therefore, if you do these sins, chapter 5, you should be kicked out of the church for the destruction of the flesh. Some of these, most of the sensual sins, are a sin unto death you start living like that, then you should not only be kicked out of the church, but God has every, every reason to destroy your body, whether it be over time as you sin or all at once. God has that right. He owns our body. So back in verse 9, when he says effeminate, this is important because in verse 11 he says, and such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Now, what's he getting at here? Are you telling me some of us used to be effeminate? Well, not in this congregation. Amen? Amen. Any of you men want to confess to that one? I didn't think so. <laughs> now, uh, I, I believe ladies should be feminine. Right. Females should be feminine. Men should be manly. And we all have these things we need to work at. At times, I'm sure ladies uh, lose their composure and they act a little rougher than they ought to. And men, sometimes out of fear, perhaps are a little weaker than they ought to. But this word effeminate is actually uh, taken out of every other Bible. It's important to understand. If you go back to the Greek, and I'm not going to, this word is interpreted three other places as soft, as in soft clothing, soft raiment. Dealing with those that wore the real soft stuff. He says, look, you're supposed to be men. You're not, you're not supposed to know what the latest collection of Calvin Klein uh, soft shirts are this year. You shouldn't care. Hey, there's nothing wrong with having nice clothes if you've earned it. That shouldn't be your focus in life. Uh, but if you work hard and, and provide well, there's nothing wrong with dressing well or composing yourself well. But it ought not to be about, you know, just going to the mall every week. If, if you're a guy and you're doing that, something's wrong. Maybe you're too a little effeminate. Maybe you're raised by mama or something like that. So understand what he's saying, because the world and their false Bibles will correct this phrase and also the next one. The next phrase is abusers of themselves with mankind. Abusers of themselves with mankind. If you would go to Galatians chapter 5. Go to Galatians chapter 5. 
the warning is such for some of you don't go back if you used to be worried about soft clothes quit doing that and just be a man right if you were uh, tied up in adultery don't go back if you were a drunkard don't go back to that life you're called out of that life you should be separate from that life such were some of you but now that you're saved you have the power of the Holy Spirit the problem is all your fake Bibles and I was going to pull a stack out and go through it tonight for the sake of time I'll just spare you some change it to catamite or homosexual or prostitute uh, or pervert or a couple others I'm not even going to repeat okay many other Bibles attack these two phrases most of the time they delete the one and then modify the other that the abusers of themselves with mankind they try to say that it's dealing with a homo or a sodomite but in first Timothy chapter 1 uh, in which you're not there I'll just read uh, it says for whoremongers for them that defile themselves with mankind what is a whoremonger that is a man that defiles himself with mankind what is a whoremonger you think about a warmonger when I'm preaching the gospel and I hear Revelation 21, 8, often I'll use this definition. What is a warmonger? Well, that's the guy that buys the war bonds. That's the guy that builds the bullets. That's the guy that shoots the bullets. That's the company that, uh, you know, tries to get us in war. That's the, the country that tries to provoke for war. A warmonger is somebody involved in the process of creating and sustaining warfare. That's a warmonger, somebody that's just pounding war, 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 go get them, let's go, come on. That's a warmonger. A whoremonger can be a man or a woman that is involved with the whoredoms of the flesh. The John, the prostitute, the, the fill in the blank, everything around that system. The people that are involved with the internet, all that, they're, they're whoremongers, okay? So the Bible uses that phrase and he defines whoremongers for them that defile themselves with mankind. When you defile and pollute your body with other flesh, you're destroying yourself. You're a whoremonger. And that is exactly what this phrase means in 1 Corinthians 6 when he says, abusers of themselves with mankind. There are abusers that hurt other people, but they're really hurting themselves in the process. They're destroying and defiling the temple that God has given them. You're in Galatians chapter 5. Let me catch up with you. Galatians chapter 5, and very interesting, look at verse 19, Galatians 5, an interesting list that's very similar, and the idea is he's trying to tell us what we're not, and what we shouldn't, in fact, go to verse 18, we'll go back one verse. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh, so here's the warning, what we ought not to look like. As Christians, this is not how we should live. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. All right, these are things Christians should not be known for. Envyings, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now here's the problem, the world the false Christian world, more specifically, will use verses like this to say, well, see, if you go back to your sin, you lose your salvation. God only saves one way, and that is forever. Salvation is everlasting life, and at the moment you have it, you're saved forever. The problem is your flesh still wants to do some of the things on this list. So we are all probably guilty of some of the things on this list. Hopefully it's not witchcraft, okay? If you're guilty of witchcraft, get out of the church. You don't belong in church, right? The warning is, that's the works of the flesh, and he continues to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and he goes, love, joy, peace, etc. So here's the warning, Christian. Now that you have power over the flesh or the Holy Spirit, don't do these works of the flesh. As he says in verse 16 in this chapter, he says, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If you would, flip ahead to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. What God's trying to teach us and warn us about is how we should live and how we should not live. And our body will not go to heaven, but we will be judged by God. And so it's important to consider that judgment as we move forward. So stay with me, we're almost done. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, let's just start in number 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. Right? <laughs> we're the children of God, so follow Him. Follow Jesus' example. And walk in love <clears throat> as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness 
or covetousness, let it not once be named as become a saints, named among you as become a saints. It's the same thing. Here's a list. These are the sins. You're probably guilty in the past, and you may do it again now that you are saved, but stop doing it. Work to stop doing these things, and you'll please the Lord. Neither, verse 4, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. <laughs> We're going to the kingdom of Christ one day. We're going to heaven one day. And we need to have a vision for that. If you would go ahead and go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And the idea here is, we're capable of all of these sins. We're forgiven of these sins. And he would that through Jesus, we would get the victory over these sins. That we would have a mentality, not a defeated mentality, but really we should have a fear of being a hypocrite and going, going and living like the unrighteous world. That They will not inherit heaven, so why should I live like them? They know what they're doing to themselves. They're destroying their lives, and we can see it, and yet your very flesh is tempted to look at what they do and lust after what they do and partake in what they do. And we ought to fight. We ought to fight against the sins of the flesh. We should not give in to the sensual desire, these sins that destroy families and destroy lives. And the warning here was, don't let it destroy your church. Don't let it in to the church. It will destroy the church. Verse number 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of of our God. What's he saying? He's trying to tell us that uh, you're washed, you're clean. He took care of it. You hit the reset button. He says you're sanctified. He says now you're set apart, you're separate. You as a Christian, you are separate and distinct from the rest of the world. You should be known by the name of Christ above all other things that you're known by in this world, in this life. And then he says, and you're justified. Look, you're saved. It's done. You're saved. Now we have every reason that we need to live for Him. And, and we'll stop for tonight in verse 12. In verse 12, though, He introduces and He says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. He's trying to tell, hey, you've got grace. Thank God you have some grace. All things are lawful. Uh, all your sins have been paid for, but shall we continue in sin? No, God forbid, he says, right? So what's he trying to tell us here? But not all things are expedient. Expedient, the definition means a, a suitable, that it is suitable for achieving a particular goal. Does that make sense? What is expedient? Well, something that's suitable for, for achieving a particular goal. So all things are lawful, but if I do these things, it, it's not suitable, it's not fit for who I am now. And it will not help me to achieve the goal of living for Christ on this earth and judging righteously. And this church had a problem with not judging the sensual sins. And because of that, we will see that they were in bondage, that they were in bondage to a defiled life and a defeated life because they would not judge. So God's commandment to us is that we should judge, especially the least of matters. Rather than going to the world, we know what God said, but in your own life with these sensual sins, he says, listen, such were some of you. We don't need to go to the world to find out if adultery is wrong. It, you, there used to be a law in Florida. If you're, wrong, if you're caught committing adultery, uh, there in some states they had a death penalty for that. Well, that's gone, isn't it? Now it's a no-fault divorce. doesn't matter. You don't have to have a reason. You can get online, and for 80 bucks you can file the paperwork, and you're done. You can go, and you can... Pull asunder what God hath brought together. And that's not God's will. God's will is that we would build up the families, build up the church, build up one another. When there's contention between brothers and sisters in Christ, ask for help in the church. Hey, brother, we're having a problem. Can you step in and give us both some wise counsel so that we don't ruin our friendship long term? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Lord, help us to learn to judge without being judgmental. Lord, help us to judge and discern according to your word. Lord, help us to build up each other inside of the church for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.